This lesson is titled, The Promise to Abraham. Now you might ask, why this subject? Well, I find that this is a subject I overlooked when I early on when I became a Christian, and I suspect many other people do overlook this promise. There is one particular promise made to Abraham that is crucial and has to do with becoming a Christian or having salvation or becoming right with God. I'd like to start this lesson by reading uh, from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. This is where God is speaking to um, Abraham. At this point, he's, his name is called Abram. And he's making promises to Abraham. In fact, he makes three promises to Abraham. And so in verse 1, we'll start reading there. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So the three promises here have to do with, first of all, um, he's going to show him the land, which makes reference to a promise about giving him and his descendants uh, the land of Canaan later on, and that he would make him a great nation. And in, the, in verse 3, he says, And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now this, this promise has to do with salvation. And the New Testament speaks quite a bit about this promise, but sometimes you may not realize that the Bible is talking about this promise when the New Testament is speaking of it. Now, one of the things, um, one of the passages I wanted to go to is in the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. I think this is a, an indirect reference to the promise to Abraham because it, it makes reference to the gospel um, in the early chapters of 1 John. But I'd like to read it in verse 24. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. In what, if what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he promised us, eternal life. Well, the gospel has to do with eternal life. Well, in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 8, it talks about how the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham. Now, in the Old Testament, the, the scriptures don't speak a lot about that so that we would really know much about this promise. And that we would even realize that it is, really is talking about the gospel. And the gospel, by the way, means literally the good news. And there's no better news than salvation. Knowing what a person needs you to be right in God. So what I'd like to do with this lesson is I'd like to talk about the beginning of this fulfillment in the New Testament. And I'd like to talk about some specific books that cover this. In the book of Acts in chapter 3 specifically, the book of Romans in chapter 4, and, and then there's a very detailed explanation in the book of Galatians in chapter 3. And then I'd like to talk about the idea of what a person needs to do to be right with God. Because the book, these books don't go in great detail as far as what a person needs to do to become right with God or restore that relationship. When we sin, we lose fellowship with God. And so therefore we need to uh, know what the Bible teaches on this subject. So again, going to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. At the end of the verse, it says, In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And they speaking of Abraham, that all families of the earth will be blessed. And in Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, it says, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. And so that makes reference to all families and Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, he has this. In your seed, he's in reference to Abraham, 
all nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed your voice. Now that suggests, with this obedience of Abraham, that faith is important. That it was because of Abraham's faith that he received these promises from, from God. Now the beginning of the fulfillment of these prophecies actually can be realized um, pretty easily starting in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And I'm going to read that. Now the context of this passage is Jesus has died for our sins, he's been raised from the dead, and he's talking to his 11 apostles, or disciples, as they're referred to there. And Jesus said in verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and in the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So here we have a passage in Matthew, chapter 28, verse 19, that makes reference to all nations. Now this promise to Abraham was to all nations, or all families of the earth. And in Matthew 28, it makes reference to baptism having to do with becoming disciples in its connection with this promise. Keep that in mind. In Mark chapter 16, and verse 15 and 16, I'd like to read this passage. This is basically the same context as Matthew chapter 28. Jesus has died for his sins. He's been raised from the dead, and he's talking to the apostles. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved but he who does not believe will be condemned. And notice in verse 15 that, he's goes, that the apostles are supposed to go to all the world and preach the gospel, which is the good news, to who? Every creature, or all families, or all nations. In Luke chapter 24, verse 47, notice what it says here. The context again is about the same as Matthew 28, and Mark 16, verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Notice that repentance is added here and is connected with remission of sins or forgiveness of sins and it should be preached in his name to who? To all nations. So you can see that it, if you didn't make that connection with Abraham and the promise you may not necessarily see this. Now, also I'd like to go to the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 39. Actually, 38 and 39. Now, the context of this passage is the apostles have uh, preached the gospel to the Jews who are in Jerusalem. And it's the day of Pentecost. And he's preaching about Jesus, and the, and the Jews, a number of them, believed in what Peter was preaching. So in verse 38, he says this, And then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off as many as our Lord, our God, will call. So notice what it says in verse 39. This forgiveness of sins is connected in verse 39 with the word for. And he says, the for, the promise, is to who? It's not only to the, the Jews, your children referring to that, the Jews and the, their children, but all who are far off. Who are those who are far off? The Gentiles. As many as the Lord, our God, will call. Now, if we go further on in the book of Acts, in chapter 3, starting in verse 13, and we're going to read through 26. It's quite a long reading, but the context here is Peter is preaching to the Jews, and he had just healed a lame man who had been lame from his birth. And it really gets the people's attention. So, in verse 13, he says this, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
The God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murder to be granted to you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised up from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, the man that was, la that was lame, that was healed, whom you see and know. And yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So a miracle has been done to this, this lame man. Verse 17, Yet now, brethren, I know you did it in ignorance. He's making reference to the, the Jews putting Jesus to death. As also did your rulers. Verse 18, But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come upon from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his prophets, holy prophets, since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you, and it shall be that every soul who, who will not hear that prophet will be utterly destroyed from among the people. Now this is a reference to Moses and Jesus. And that Jesus would be that person, that prophet, that be raised up from among the people. And if the people don't hear him, they would be destroyed. And verse 24, and he adds this, and yes, all the prophets from Samuel and, from, and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and, notice what it says, in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, that is the Jews, God having raised up, this Jesus, servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So the, the concept here is the idea of turning away is the idea of repentance. And he connects that with the, the promise to Abraham. Now, I'd like to also turn to the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 4, and I'd like to read verses 13 through 18. Now, the book of Romans, it's important to understand the context of the book of Romans, in particular because it's often confused. Um, a lot of uh, conclusions people draw sometimes are not correct because they haven't been careful about the context. Now, the, the book of Romans was written to show the Jewish Christians that the Gentiles are just as acceptable to God as the, the uh, Jews are. And so it's important to know that. But in verse 13 starting, it's going to talk about the promise to Abraham. And he's going to argue that the promise to Abraham of, of salvation is not through the law of Moses, but it's through the promise to Abraham, which is to all nations, to all people, all families of the earth. In verse 13 starting, for the promise that he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law of Moses, but through the righteousness of faith. So the promise is not through the law of Moses, he's saying in verse 13. But the promise is through the righteousness of faith. Verse 14. For if those who are, are of the law, law, which is referring to the Moses, our heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. And this passage is referring to the law of Moses because that's what they're dealing with. They're trying to impose the law of Moses as something mandatory for Christians to follow. Verse 15, because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. 
Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to, to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As is it written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he might become, became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. So the argument here is, it's not through the law of Moses that the promise of eternal life is given. It's through the promise to Abraham, which was before the law of Moses. Now, if we want to get into great detail about this promise, um, the book of Galatians has a very detailed explanation of this promise to Abraham. And the explanation of this starts in chapter 3. And we're going to read most of chapter 3. And the context of Galatians is also somewhat important because the context is an argument that um, against the idea that circumcision is mandatory in order to be, be a Christian, to be right with God. And they've added one thing, Jewish Christians had added one thing, and the beginning of the book talks about them being cursed because they added this one thing and it's changed the gospel. So it's important to understand um, these things. So starting in verse, uh, verse 1, he's going to call the Galatians foolish because they're listening to this idea that they're supposed to be circumcised in order to be right. Now why were they trying to impose that? It's because they were being persecuted by the Jews, by the, their families and their friend, friends for hanging around Gentiles, non-Jews, because they weren't circumcised. And if they were circumcised, they wouldn't be persecuted. And so that's why there was a big dispute on that. And that's why there's so much written in the New Testament on that subject. Verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? And as he's referring to the law there is of law of Moses. In fact, for this, this entire discussion is talking about the law of Moses. Or by the hearing of faith. Are you foolish? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? In reference to the law of Moses. Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed, if it was in vain. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Verse 6, just as Abraham believed, it was accounted to him for righteousness. So it's making reference to Abraham's great faith here. Verse 7, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Now this is important because it's talking about being sons of Abraham. And that reference has to do with eternal life. Verse 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So we need to believe that this promise has to do with salvation because it's going to be referenced to a little later on that that seed of Abraham where everybody has his blessings is through is to Jesus Christ, our Savior. In verse 10, For as many are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He's talking about the law of Moses. Having become a curse for us, 
For it was written, Curses everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in who? Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. How? Through faith. That means trusting and believing what God says. That's what the faith and belief of the Bible is primarily. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant. Yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. In other words, no one voids or takes away from it or adds to it. Verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say to seeds as of many, but as one. And notice what he says. He's making application to Christ here. And your seed, who is Christ? And this I say, that the law of Moses, it was basically reference to the law of Moses, which was 430 years later, cannot annul or void the covenant was confirmed before by God in Christ, that the promise should be of no effect. So the idea here is, it's through the covenant or the promise that God made through Abraham that salvation would be have reference to. Now, we're going to drop down to verse 23, where it picks up. The verses in between just refer more to the law of Moses and the purpose of it. But I think verse 23 makes it probably a good uh, summarized statement of what the law of Moses was about. But before faith came, the Jews were kept under guard by the law, referring to the law of Moses, kept for faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Again, that's a reference to the law of Moses. So, and he makes reference to that faith is important. It's through faith in Christ and trusting him enough to do what he says is where we have, make ourselves right with God. Verse 25, But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God. How? Through faith in Christ Jesus. Then notice what verse 27 says. He makes a connection. He says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now this is important, these passages, because this promise to Abraham, he tells us how we get it. He tells us that we get it through faith, and he says that we're sons of God, verse 26, through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says in verse 27, there's a connection with that. And he says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In other words, you're not in Christ unless you're baptized. And then he goes on and says that we're all one, basically. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, nor female, male or female, but we're all supposed to be one in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on in verse 29, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So, what we see in Galatians chapter 3 is a summary of what a person needs to do to become a Christian. This book is written to Christians, the book of Galatians. In fact, most of the New Testament, if not all the New Testament, is written to Christians. And that makes a difference in how we view the scriptures. And so he says, basically, the last step in becoming a Christian is being baptized. That's how we get into Christ. So this will be a little bit more specific on how to become a Christian. In Mark 16, and verse 16, this is Jesus speaking to his apostles. And he's talking about making disciples. And he says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. He says, Belief and baptism is connected with being saved. That's important to know. What else does Jesus say? Well, in Luke chapter 24, verse 47, 
It's basically the same context. Jesus died for our sins. He's been raised from the dead. And he's talking to his apostles. And he's making some statements on how to make disciples of Christ. And he's connecting that with forgiveness of sins. In verse 47, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. To who? In his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So, so far we see it's important that we must believe. We must believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and he was raised from the dead. We need to be willing to be baptized, and we need to repent of our sins. And verse, in chapter uh, 10 of Romans, verses 9 and 10, we have a specific statement that has to do with confession on what a person needs to do to have salvation. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So here's something else that we need to do. We need to be willing to confess to Jesus is Lord. And to believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. And he's connecting it with being saved. And then finally, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, where Peter has just finished preaching to the, the Jews on the day of Pentecost. And those who were believed, he said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as our Lord, our God, will call. So this passage talks about the importance of repenting, changing your mind about who Jesus is, and being baptized for the remission or forgiveness of sins. And therefore, we would inherit the promise of eternal life, as is suggested in verse 39. I'd like to invite you to watch our show at the same time next week.